If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. We're going to be in verses 1 through 6. Uh, so my name is David Camp. I'm filling in for Stan this week. And um, so it's, a, it's an honor to be able to, to fill in for Stan and to be with you guys here today. Um, now, as we look at Revelation, chapter 3, uh, specifically at verses 1 through 6, we're continuing our journey or our road trip. <clears throat> and the church that we come to is a church that you, you will know as the church at Sardis. Now, what's interesting about the church at Sardis is uh, there was little to nothing in, in terms of compliments. So, uh, so I get the privilege this week of of maybe not delivering a really feel good message. So, uh, so it, it's, I, I'll forewarn you that this is an intense passage. Uh, it's one that is challenging, um, and, and I'm gonna posture according to how Jesus specifically was speaking to the church at Sardis. But when you look at the church, if you were to sum up what was going on here, is the church at Sardis was classified as dead although they appeared to be alive. So they were advertised as alive, but the reality was that they were dead. The church at Sardis could actually be classified as phony, giving the appearance of life, but actually dead. And as we dive in, what we're trying to pull today from this particular text is this. We're gonna take a look at the harsh realities of our personal relationship with Christ. Listen, this is important. We're gonna look at the harsh realities of our personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the collective reality of us as a body, and we're going to ask ourselves the question, am I real or am I phony? And if we are phony, then we wanna correct the course and ensure that we are demonstrating a life that is vibrant and alive in the person of Jesus Christ. Let us pray together. Father, as we enter into your word this morning, may you speak to us. God, you know the heart, the condition. You know the position of every single person in this room. And there is a word that you choose to speak to us individually as well as collectively. May God, our spirit be open, ready to receive, and may we, not, not, God, not just hear the word, but act on the word and apply it to our lives. In the powerful name of Jesus, I pray, amen. So given that we're on a road trip series, I wanna set the stage for you. Uh, have you ever taken a road trip, your excitement level is really, really high, only to find that when you arrive, you're actually disappointed in what you experience. So, for example, what maybe you saw on the brochure is not the reality of what you see once you arrive at this particular location. Many years ago, when uh, in my youth ministry days, when I was a young man and I had the energy to stay up for lock-ins and all those great things, uh, I, I had the joy of planning a summer retreat. And uh, at this particular summer retreat, there was a brochure that was on my desk in the office one day, and so it come in the mail, and it got directed to me, and it was this really cool-looking retreat center. I mean, it was, it, the brochure was off the charts, and I said, we're going there. When I looked at this brochure, it was in the foothills of, of Murphy, North Carolina, the mountains up in Murphy, North Carolina, and, uh, and it, was, it was like, okay, it's got zip lines, that was cool. Uh, it had a pool, that was cool. It had a natural slide built into the foothills of the mountains. So myself and all the kids, we could have a good time going down the, the, the slide uh, on the side of the mountain. It had really large accommodations, so there was amphitheater, there was a large area in the middle of this field, there was a creek and a stream running by. I mean, it had everything that you possibly could want to have fun uh, and to go pursue God, right? And so, um, but we loaded up the vans and we started, and it was about a two and a half hour drive. Our church was in Marietta. So two and a half, three hour drive, going past Blue Ridge into Murphy, 
Uh, and we got there, and it was, it was, you know, it was, it was dusk. It was, you know, uh, early evening. And as we pulled up, have you ever had an uh-oh moment? An uh-oh moment? It was a uh-oh moment. And what made this particular uh-oh moment interesting is that my wife was sitting to the right of me in the passenger seat in the particular van that we were driving. And uh, the first words that came out of my mouth, I turned to my wife and I said, look, I'm gonna get the kids settled in. I'm gonna drive you back to Powder Springs, Georgia, and uh, I'll be back here before breakfast. Because the reality of what I saw was the zip line was a, a rope with a, a wooden handle and you had no ability to stop yourself. You were gonna have to dive off to stop and the only thing I could think about, well, that's an accident waiting to happen and I'm gonna file the church insurance claim. Uh, there were no bathrooms, there were porta potties and you took a, uh, you bathed in the creek, not necessarily in the shower and the pool was at the YMCA which is down the street and the slide down the mountain was a hill that was just a mudslide that he, this guy had, had uh, in particular, I guess he had wet, poured, poured a water hose or something on the hill. And so this was actually not a situation that was going to, going to work. And uh, so, but we made it work. When I looked at Angela, there were two conversations that we had. She said, look, you're not taking me back because the moment you take me back, you're gonna have mutiny with the rest of these kids. So I'm here. And then the second thing that she said, she and one of our leaders, Nancy Jeffries, at the time, she was one of our adult leaders, they began to inform me that it was the last retreat location that I was ever going to pick in my existence at that church. And guess what? In seven years, I never picked another retreat location. The brochure and the reality Two different things, they didn't match. Now, that, my friends, is a simple story that tells the truth of the issue with the church at Sardis, and it tells the truth about the challenge that we're going to receive today. Sardis appeared alive, but the reality was it was a church that was dead, not as advertised. Read with me Revelation chapter three, verses one through six. To the angel of the church in Sardis, write this. These are the words from him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your what? Your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete, note that, I have not found your deeds complete or mature in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They walk with me, they're dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. So this church is strongly challenged And the challenge is pick a road, pick a direction. Will you choose the road of life or will you choose the road of death? You see, the road of life, a believer that is alive and a a church that is alive is an individual and a body that is ordained by God. It is fueled by the power of God, the movement of God, the direction of God, the will of God. But the road of death, for a man or for a church, it is fueled by programs, it's fueled by methods, it's fueled by ritual, it's fueled by religion, it's filled with man's idea, and it has no impact, no influence, and it is lifeless, lifeless. So today, as you look at this text, and it challenges us, We have to ask ourselves 
that question, for those of us here today, we have to ask ourselves, the road in which we choose, are we individuals who are really phony, not as advertised, we appear, we do all the right things, we say all the right things, we know all the religious terms, or are we individuals who are in a passionate pursuit of God, the person of Jesus Christ, with a desire to reflect who Jesus is, his love, his grace, and his mercy to all that we come in contact with and to all that we know. In fact, this conversation, this message has a level of intensity and urgency that reflects this type of posture. The posture that you see in this text is one in which Jesus is sitting face to face and he's issuing a challenge to the individual believer. He's issuing a challenge to the church and he's asking them the question, which is this. Are you an individual who is phony or are you an individual who is alive? Are you a body that represents the person of Jesus Christ or are you a body that's going through the motions of religion? So let me ask you, let me posture for us. We have to ask ourselves this question. When we think about our relationship with the person of Christ individually, are you real or are you phony? Are you a person that is committed completely to what it is that Jesus wants to do in and through your life and your desire is chasing his purpose? Your pursuit in life is what is it that God desires to do with me as opposed to what is it that, that I desire to do with my existence? Are you an individual that is religious? Are you an individual that comes to church out of habit? Did you walk into, the, into this room today because it's a thing that you do each and every Sunday? Did you sing the song that was sung because you're supposed to sing the song because everybody else is singing the song? Or when you were singing that song, were you actually thinking today even, were you, when you were thinking about the song Surrounded, were you thinking about that battle as Sam talked about that you're either in, going through, or about to go into? Which is it? Are we real in our relationship with Jesus Christ or are we going through the motion? Now what I will say is this, I have found that there are seasons of our existence there are moments where we're going through the motion. We're not as advertised. If you really knew what was going on in here, you wouldn't like it. If you really knew what was happening in here, you wouldn't believe it. We go through that. And so it is important that we challenge ourselves on a regular basis. Am I walking the road of life? Am I going down the road of death, the road of religion? Which one is it for me? And we need to sit Face to face, I wrote, there was a moment recently in my life where God and I were face to face. And in that moment, I had to make a choice as to what I wanted to be and what I wanted him to do in and through me. Did I choose his life through me, or am I choosing my life and what I want my life to be? Which one is it? It can't be both. It's one or the other. That's the posture. Do you remember a coach getting in your face in that way? Do you remember a parent getting in your face in that way? Do you remember a spouse getting in your face that way? That's the posture of this text. So I want you to take your bulletin and on the back of that bulletin, there is a message note section and I want you to draw a line right down the middle of it. And on one side, I want you to put the road of death. On the other side, I want you to put the road of life. What does the road of death look like? What does it look like? A church or an individual that's meandering around uh, down the road of death looks like this. Everything is about me. If I'm moving down the road of life, it's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's all about what I desire. It's all about me, me, me. 
Isn't that a Toby Keith song, I think? Was that what it was, right? For country music fans, all right? So it's all about me. And everything, when it's about me, is man-made. Everything is for me. Everything is to benefit me. And when you're moving down the road of religion, it is filled with a myriad of man-made methods along the way. It looks the part on the outside, but on the inside, there's not the life of the person of Jesus Christ that exists. In fact, I like 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. It says this, there's the appearance of God, but it lacks the power. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power. Then there's the next road, the road of life. What does the road of life look like as a believer? If I'm living and thriving in my relationship with Jesus Christ, as a body, if we're living and thriving and doing as God desires to do with us as a body, what does that look like? It's directed by God. Everything is focused on God. Every song we sing, every deed that we do, every dollar that we give, it is given for a very specific purpose, and that is to bring glory to God. And when we bring glory to God in all that we do, God begins to ordain that. And along this road, you will encounter the unexplainable power and presence of God where what occurs cannot be attributed to the method and the madness of man, but it can only be attributed to the goodness and the power of the person of Jesus Christ. There's a difference. We say, David, <clears throat> that's good. So you, you shared with me the road, but I, how do I know what does it look like along the way? What are the signs that you can give me? I don't know if I'm walking down the road of death, the road of religion, or I don't know if I'm walking down the road of life that's bathed in the person of Christ. How can I know? Well, I'm gonna give you six attributes of death and six attributes of life. Let's talk death. What does it look like? If you're a person that's phony, not as advertised, you're actually dead, you're not real, what does it look like? Number one, it's superficial. You're superficial. The perception is that you know God. You know the lingo, you know the language. But it's all superficial. There's nothing really deep or passionate in your understanding and your knowledge of the person of Jesus Christ. It's just sort of, uh, I'm going through the motions. The second thing is it's all about doing. What can I do to measure up? What can I do to be a pleasure to man? What can I do to somehow be accepted? It's all about measuring up. The third thing is someone who is dead is all about personal achievement. It's all about look at me. It's all about the attention that I can gain. It's all about the glory that I can receive because of all that I am doing along this road of death. Fourth, along this road, you'll see people that are man pleasers. What do other people think about this? Should I be doing this? I wonder what they would say. Should I say this because maybe they won't like it? I mean, we live in a society today, if you think about, look, the reality and the truth about the gospel, the person of Jesus Christ, his death and his burial and his resurrection, why do we have to soft sell the power and the authority of the person of Jesus Christ that changed the face of the earth? Why? Think about it. One individual with 12 men, all of those disciples primarily giving their lives, martyred, transformed a world with billions and billions of Christians. Think about that. Why do I have to be worried about offending people because I tell them about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the person of Christ and how it changed my life? Why? Because I'm a man pleaser. I don't want to offend you. I'm a man pleaser. That's the road of death. Self-sufficient. Along this road of death, it's all about what I can do. I can. I can. I've got these talents. I've got these attributes. I've got this ability. I can. I can. I can. And it's all about self-fulfillment. By self-fulfillment, it's about the desires of all the blessings. God can give me this blessing. God, I want that blessing. It's all about fulfilling my desires, my needs, my wants. It's all self-fulfillment. 
What about alive? To the contrary. A person that is alive is real. A person that is alive says, this is me. When you get engaged with a person that has come in contact with the person of Jesus Christ and knows grace and knows forgiveness, knows mercy and knows compassion, when you get engaged with an individual where life has crushed that person and the only thing that they had that enabled them to survive was Jesus Christ, the only thing that pulled them up out of that lowest moment in their life, that person is a person who is real. That person says, this is me. This is where I've been. And listen, which, in, which individual has greater impact and greater influence? The one who says, oh, this is what I want you to think I am. But the one that says, no, let me tell you about my life. Let me tell you what I have experienced. Let me show you my fault. Let me show you the misdirection in my life. Let me show you the mistakes that I have made. Why? Because that individual, by being real with you, reminds you what? That God does have power. Reminds you that God does come down to the lowest points in our life. Lifts us up. That God never puts us in a position where he says, I desert you, I leave you. That's real. This is me. The second thing is it's about being. Being. Being in Christ, being what Christ desires me to be. Not doing, it's about being. Being the person of Christ in the lives of other people. The third thing about an individual that is alive is that they understand God's purpose. That the reason that I exist today is not to fulfill my own desires, but I exist today because God has a purpose for my life. God has a plan and God has a reason. Listen, we're not here by accident. What is your why? Why did God put you on this earth? Why did God put you in this community? Why does God have you a part of West Cobb Church? Why, why, why? God has a purpose for every single life, every single existence on this planet, and we have a responsibility to find that it is in that, it is in that, that you and I can be an impact. It is in that that you and I can have influence. It's in that that you and I can touch a world in a way to where they can see and know the reality of Jesus Christ like never before. But it requires us to be real. It requires us to pursue being and not doing. It requires us to pursue his purpose and not our plans. Fourth is being a God pleaser. Along the road of life, a God pleaser. Listen, think about that. A God pleaser, when we're alone, if we are pursuing, bringing pleasure to God, it changes how we think and how we act, whether we're around people or not, because we want our life to reflect God and God alone. Think about, think about the life of David. We know the life of David. And when he committed his sin with Bathsheba, who was David trying to please in that moment? Who? Himself. And then the prophet Nathan had to confront him. And he described this story to David. And David looks at him and goes, who did that? Who did that? Who did that? And what did Nathan say? You. You're the one. You're the one. And it was in that moment that David broke because what David came to understand is that he was in a moment, a, life, a part of his life where he was consumed with pleasing himself and he had moved away from being a person that would please God. When you move from life to death or death to life, your focus is pleasing God. Fifth is God dependent. God dependent. He can. I mean, do you really believe the song Surrounded that we sing? Sang? Do you really believe that? When you are surrounded, that the power of God can invade your existence and do things that you cannot do? Do you really believe that? And are you willing to have faith in that? That even when God isn't delivering in your time, in your way, according to your plan or according to your pattern, that you continue to stay faithful, you continue to pursue, you continue to seek to please him. And then the sixth, attribute 
of someone that is alive, a church that is alive, an individual that's alive in Christ is God pursuit. It's his presence. I desire to be in his presence. I desire to always constantly ensure that everything that I do and how I do it is about God. It's about him being present in all that I am and all that I do, that I don't just take God and put him over here in this section of my life, because most of us do that. We say, God, you can have this part. You can't have this part. You can have this section, but God, you, you, you can't have this section of my life. Listen, when we're in pursuit of God, we want God to invade our entire existence, our entire being. Why? Because we know that when he invades our lives and he invades our existence, we can discover the plan and the purpose and the reason, and we can be an individual and a body that influences and impacts the world as he intended us to be. A person that is dead, listen to this. The dead soul does not want God for who he is. The dead soul will take God on his or her terms. The dead soul defines how God fits, how God works, how God operates. The dead soul wants to hold back and not let go. But a person who discovers life discovers this. A love that can never be fathomed. A life that can never die. A righteousness that can never be tarnished. A peace that can never be understood. A rest that can never be disturbed. A joy that can never, never be diminished. A hope that can never be disappointed. A glory that can never be clouded. A light that can never be darkened a purity that can never be defiled, a beauty that can never be marred, a wisdom that can never be baffled, and resources that can never be exhausted. Which road, which road are you on? I gave you the attributes, death versus life. Where do you see yourself individually? Where do you see us as a body collectively? Which road are we on? And now I leave you with this. If we want to be alive, what do we do? If we want to be alive, what is it that we do? If you notice in that text, when he described their works or he described their, he described their existence, how did he describe their existence? Do you remember? Incomplete, right? What did he say? He said, if you look, he said, you have a reputation, being alive, but you're dead. Wake up, strengthen that which remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of God. You see, listen, when we choose life, when you look at that text, we have to ask ourselves this question. When it's all said and done, when your life is over, and someone stands to preach the funeral of your life, will they say that that was a life that was complete? Or will they say that was a life that was incomplete? Which will they say? Which is it that speaks of you individually? 20 years from now, when people look at the body, West Cobb Church, Will they see a church that completed the work of God? Or will they see a church with incomplete deeds? You see, because what happens to us individually also happens collectively. See, when we get out of step with our pursuit of God, the church starts to look like this. You know, the things that matter is how loud is the music. The things that matter is the type of song that we sing. The things that matter is what does it look like when people walk in? The things, and not that these things aren't important, but what happens is we become enamored with the doing of church as opposed to being enamored with the pursuit of Jesus Christ, God himself. And it's easy, it's easy to fall into the trap of being enamored with the methodology of man. 
as opposed to being passionate about the pursuit and of understanding the person of Jesus Christ. Here's the difference. In that text, he tells them, he says, I want you to listen. I want you to remember. I want you to repent. He tells them this. And here's the best way for me to sum that up for you. There are some of us in school, our mission when we walked into a test, our mission was to answer the question. There were other people in that class, when they were in school, their mission was to understand the subject. It's a difference. It's a complete difference between someone who wants to know and understand the subject matter and someone who wants the answers to the test. Have you been there? Huh? Have you been there in that moment? Yeah, I, I, I remember being in college and I was taking a class that was called statics. And statics is about materials and how pressure and other things form and shape. Uh, and and it, was, it, was, it was a structural class for mechanical engineering. I had to take it. It was an elective. That was my elective, not PE. It was, that was my elective. And I remember sitting in that class, and there was a guy that sat next to me, his name was Greg Patterson, he had a 1600 on the SAT, went to the same high school that I went to, and so I thought, I'm gonna sit next to Greg in this class. And my hope was, by sitting next to Greg, that somehow I would get the answers to the test. So we go in and we take the first test. And in that test and in that moment, he takes that test in 10 minutes. I took that test in one and a half hours. I didn't have time, he moved through that thing so fast, I didn't have time to look for the answers on his paper. It wasn't gonna happen. The difference was what? He knew the material. I was looking for the, and what happens with us today in our culture is this. We live in a culture that wants to seek and pursue the blessing of God as opposed to seek and pursue being a blessing to others that reflects who God is. And we wonder why we have no effect when we walk out the door. We wonder why we have no influence when we walk out the door. We wonder why we can't penetrate a culture we wonder why things around us are changing and the church seems to be weakening as opposed to strengthening. And that's because we are walking a road of death that's filled with the myriad of religious activities as opposed to being on a pursuit to know a real and living God who changes lives today. This past week, um, I wasn't gonna use this illustration because I, did, I really didn't know if I could get through it and I didn't wanna cry, but I'm gonna be real. <clears throat> so um, two weeks ago, we put my father in in a home hospice. He's, he's 88, uh, about to be 88. He'll be 88 in December. And um, so, um, you know, my dad wants to die at home. And uh, he's lived a great life, great father. I have absolutely no regrets. So what I'm doing is they told us and they told him, listen, you could live a week, you could live a month, you could live till Christmas. So the moment they told my dad Christmas, Guess what I know about my dad? He'll get to Christmas. I know him. He's a tough old dude. He'll get to Christmas. And so, what I've been doing to sort of keep him energized is in my community that I grew up in, we, we all played baseball at a park called Milford Ballpark. Any Milford people around here? Okay. We all played ball there. And most of us either played baseball at Osborne High School or at McEachard High School that played at Milford. And so my dad, and you know how all the dads, I can name these dads that grew up in the ballpark. And, and now today, when they see us, all they wanna talk about, and they wanna remember what? They wanna remember when. 
And so um, a buddy of ours, Greg Skinner, uh, who grew up here, uh, came over to visit his mom and he spent two and a half hours with my dad. My dad goes from down and depressed to how many days do I have? To It's like, well, there's, what's, people are walking in the house going, what's, okay, what's wrong with him again? How, how long does he, he what's, what's going on? And then, and then this past week, I meet a buddy of mine in Rome uh, who's from Rome. He, I meet him at, uh, we have lunch at uh, Henry's in Ackworth. And then we go with two of my buddies to see my dad that we all grew up playing ball together. And what do we do? We sit there with my dad and for two hours, what do we talk about? He, he knows stuff that I don't even recall or remember. He remember plays and games, all of this. And his energy level went from here to here. Why? Because he remembered. And in remembering, you saw life. Listen, I believe this. In the church today, if we, in our personal life and as a body, will remember to always always, always reflect on that moment that we discovered the person of Jesus Christ. Because in that moment, what did we find? We found purpose. In that moment, we found meaning. In that moment, we found direction in Christ. And in that moment, we discovered grace that we had not discovered before. We discovered forgiveness that had never been given to us before. We discovered mercy and compassion Because remember, in Christ, there's the power to transform the greatest of transgressors and set forth the lives of all mankind on a pursuit and a journey for God. For God. Because in him, when we pursue him, when we remember him, when we remember all that he has done, all that he is doing, and all that he will do, it enables us to be people of life. Because the main thing is still the main thing. And the fact is, is that Jesus Christ came to this earth, was crucified on a cross. He was placed in a grave, thought to be dead. He overcame the grave, lived, and now has influenced, as I said earlier, billions of people in the cause of the person of Christ and disposed on them grace, love, mercy, and forgiveness that they can't find from the world. They can't find it in the world. You're as good to the world as what you can do for them. That's your value. What can you do for me? That's your value. But Jesus saw enough value in each of us. He saw enough value and such a desire to have a relationship with us that he was willing to forego heaven and experience the crucifixion, the cross, And on our behalf, take on that sin. And listen, I'm the worst person about beating myself up for, I'll go days, years, and weeks beating myself up over wrong that I've done. But I'm telling you this, the Bible declares to us that grace after grace after grace after grace is day by day by day by day by day, moment by moment by moment by moment. God has a use and a purpose for all of us, individually and collectively. The challenge is, Will we choose that pursuit? I want to conclude with this. What is it? I asked you the question earlier. If you're dead and gone, and they talk about your life, incomplete or complete, I ask you this. When it's all said and done, What is it that will be said of you and me? It's either one of two things. A religious zealot elevating ourselves in pride above others. The pursuit of being better than. Or will it be said of you and me that we were pursuers of Jesus? Dispensing on mankind love, grace, and bestowing on others just a glimpse of God's love and his miraculous glory. And in all, 
and through all that we do in this life, they see in us Jesus. And because of that, they choose to pursue life with him. When you enter your 50s, I may or may not be there. When you enter your 50s, you you think a lot about life. You think a lot about the time that you have left. And it can be a shocking moment to where you go, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? And for whom? And you draw some some conclusions about the things that matter. Listen to me, teenagers. You don't get this or understand. If I could bottle this up, I would be more worth more than Zuckerberg. But when you know and understand that what matters is the plan and the purpose and the direction that God has for your life and your pursuit of life in him means far more than the pursuit of the things of this world, you'll make a difference. Look at a guy like Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow, hitting 138 in AAA. 138 in AAA. He should quit. Playing baseball. But you know why Tim Tebow plays baseball? You know why Tim Tebow plays football? Is it because he wants, does, does Tim Tebow want to be known as baseball player, football player? What Tim Tebow wants to be known as a difference maker. What do you want to be known as? Do you want to be known by your job? Is that what you want to be known as? Or do you want to be known as someone who impacted lives beyond life, beyond life, beyond life for the person of Jesus Christ? We can do that individually and we can do that collectively. But guess what? I said this earlier. We're in a post-Christian culture. You know, back in the 70s and 80s when I was growing up, you could have an event, a bunch of people would come in, you could have a good preacher, bang, they come down, you have all of these salvations, whatever. Yeah, look, those days are gone. Christianity is hard now. Why? Because the only way you make a difference is you choose to get involved. You choose to go out one-on-one, one touch at a time, one word at a time, one person at a time, you choose to invade the culture. And I, and I would say, I don't know that our church, the, the church in America, the modern church, I don't know that they're ready to do that. It's inconvenient. It takes up too much time. It's not about me. What do you mean? It's gonna, that inconveniences me. Why am I going to do that? I'm not going to get involved. If I get involved with that person, oh, do you know how much time I got to spend if I get involved with that person? So we go through our activities and we go about our way not to be involved. That's death. But life says we choose pursuit. Life says we choose to be. Life says we choose to be a God pleaser. Where are you? Where are we as a body? You can only answer that for you. I can only answer that for me. But that's the challenge that was issued to the church at Sardis. And sometimes we need that challenge. Let us pray. God, this morning, Through the church at Sardis, you issue a powerful challenge to us individually. And God, I pray for each of us in this room, and I pray for us as a body collectively that our desire, our desire will be to pursue you. Our desire will be to fulfill that purpose and that plan that you have for us. 
that when people look at our lives, they won't see an individual consumed with self, but they'll see an individual consumed with reflecting the reality of Jesus Christ in the world in which they live. One word, one touch, one moment, one person at a time. In the name of Christ, I pray.